very warm welcome, Rob Johnson, today um, at the show, which is Access to Perspectives Conversations. It's great having you, Rob. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Joe. So pleasure to be here. So, Rob, you are the director of your company called Research mm -hmm. Consulting um, and are yeah, basically informing research stakeholders, primarily publishers, but also um, researchers themselves and other stakeholders in best practices and scholarly publishing and the wider um, science communication practices. Um, could we start the conversation, um, which will very much um, rotate around current developments, open access, um, the, the different forms of open access, where you see the trend is going, the challenges that we're experiencing these days, mm -hmm. um, conceptions and misconceptions um, on around these topics. But before we dive right in, um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey that brought you um, to, like from where you were, and to to build your consultancy and what you enjoy about the work that you do and yeah. sure so um so i've just actually just passed a decade as a consultant so we had a little birthday party just last oh. week with my with my oh. team our 10th birthday for research consulting and so then uh, on the website congratulations congratulations <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, no, it's nice to make it to that to that milestone. So, yeah, I've had 10 years of working as a consultant um, across research and scholarly communication. So actually, actually, the biggest part of what we do is working with universities across the team. But I personally do a lot in scholarly communication and with publishers and, and funders. And how I found my way into that was a little bit circuitous. So before I was a consultant, I, I worked at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Um, I was in a research management role there, so I don't have an academic background my, myself. And uh, and going back further still, I originally trained as a chartered accountant. So um, so my role at the university was particularly looking at funding and how we deal with all the funds coming in from uh, UK research councils, European Commission, and so on. In those days, pre pre Brexit, this was, mm. and. Um, and at that point, this was just about when research funders were starting to implement mandates around open access. So really, that took me into contact with my colleagues in the library, with publishers, trying to figure out how do these funder mandates get translated into practice. And uh, and so I learned a lot about open access in uh, in those days and and really just found it fascinating. You know, it was just a really interesting area. I think this intersection between academia and publishing and the not-for-profit and the commercial publishers. And I think it actually crystallizes in many ways, a lot of challenges we see in society at large about what is the role of the market? Where should the state or not-for-profit or community actors play a role? And really for the last 10 to 15 years I've just been sort of looking at some of those questions on behalf of different actors and trying to figure out you know how do we make the system better and the um I started from a position of you know why isn't this stuff open you know it just seems like such a no-brainer and um and I'd say that's still you know that's still my default and that's still what I'm looking to do is work towards making things open but of course the more you look at it the more you realize the complexities and the nuances and that open doesn't solve everything yeah yeah i agree as it's also words um but i'm often missing in the conversations is the um the talks around the limitations of open like to what degree should we consider research not to be open and where can it not to be open for various reasons and what's often first and almost only being mentioned is gdpr compliance or you know um sensitive data when it comes to personal data of in the medical context, but there's many other reasons for um, keeping certain data sets and, and research results confidential. Mm -hmm. um, when you think of possible military applications, and then th the other side is, of course, that the military funds a lot of research for that very purpose. Um, but that's a, that's a conversation maybe not for today, but um, <laughs> it's, yeah, there's there's a lot of complexities and they're just these are just two examples of um like and I feel like also or what we what we're observing now is that almost everyone is talking about open science and yet the adoption of open science practices is is quite low. 
like mm, uh, mm. the researchers have a lot of fears that, or or even if they want to they find themselves being entrapped in the publisher parish paradigm um because um as much as everyone is on board like um to changing the system the actual change takes time and a lot of detail needs to be processed and administrative um yeah levels and and decision making positions mm. so where do you see opportunities or also like or what's your take on that like where do you see how we can leapfrog or do we just have to sit it through and allow time to pass to for the transition to being made um in a way that takes everyone on board yeah it's a really good question i i think i think to some degree it does just take time and um and trying to you know there's that classic thing of move fast and break things isn't there from the sort of tech companies and so on and, and we're kind of seeing some of the adverse consequences of of that in other aspects of society and i think having been following the sort of transition to open access for yeah getting on for a, a decade and a half or or so when you take a step back we have moved an incredibly long way so i think it's worth thinking if you go back 10 years in time where we are now in terms of the levels of open access many people almost wouldn't have believed how far we'd we'd come though certainly it's un uneven but many parts of europe you know we're at kind of 80 percent 90 percent of uh, content being open access i was doing a project with with the Dutch universities a year or two ago saying, how do we get to 100%? And we're all, already almost there, but how do we do the last the last bit? So I think it's important not to be too discouraged when things happen slowly. It doesn't mean change isn't happening. It just can be quite imperceptible. Um, yeah. But uh, the other thing is that there's, there's a lot of factors that essentially build inertia into the system and clearly the biggest one as you say is that kind of publish or perish culture the incentives in in academia and a lot of the focus is is shifting now to how do we change incentives but that is a very a very long game so to mm -hmm. answer your question I wouldn't see it just as sitting it out you know these things haven't happened by chance it is the result of a lot of lobbying and work and evidence gathering it just takes a long time to come to fruition yeah yeah okay i totally subscribe to that um you mentioned research integrity or research incentives and um <laughs> i mentioned integrity now because also mm. i know that you've done a or on, on a repeater doing um investigations and and studies on um for clients on research integrity and how research integrity can also be measured and um, incentivized through from the business lingo or KPIs like key performance indicators or yeah, what, what are the indicators for research integrity? And would you like to me, research integrity is working according to open science practices. At large, well, of course, this can be discussed in detail, but um, mm. this really is for me open science, not necessarily being fully open as in um, fully translucent, but um, as open as as feasible, as open as possible at a time, given the circumstances, given the state and the progress of the research project, and of course, always considering the the contextual setting. Um, yeah, but yeah. then. If like for those who are familiar with the principles of open science, it's really about collaboration, um, inter interoperability, making systems function and work, transparency, all the values that we as humans um, are um, easy to comply with around the world, really. Um, so and that also um, some or there are a few policies at research institutions when they talk about research integrity that's exactly that so there's quite a like an almost 100 percent match between what it means um like for the def definition or the interpretation of open science um as compared to research integrity um already where where are potential differences mm. the, the differences are i don't know i'm just answering my own question <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well <laughs> 
It, no, it, it's uh, so so research integrity is an area that we've uh, obviously it's always been important. But what as consultants, what we tend to find is, you know, what do people come and ask us about and what do they want us to look at is an indicator of the zeitgeist to some mm-hmm. degree. And I think we've seen integrity really move up the agenda. And interestingly, that goes for all of the groups that we work with. So, you know, we do, we work with funders, we work with institutions, we work with publishers, and we're seeing all of them just get a little bit more concerned about the integrity of the scholarly record, about integrity of research practices. Um, So to what extent is this synonymous with open science? Um, What we found when we looked at it, and we did do a project saying, you know, are there meaningful indicators of integrity? Mm -hmm. Um, And, of course, the answer is it, it depends. You know, there, oh, are, right. there are some things you can track and and actually open science practices is an, an element of integrity, which absolutely does, I think, support and underpin research integrity in terms of reproducible working, transparency, mm-hmm. sharing of data. And that's probably the element of integrity that is most amenable to sort of tracking where you can get a sense of how things go. But of course, integrity is a much bigger set of issues so there's all sorts of things around sort of care and care for the work that you're doing respect for research participants things that are not amenable to to tracking you know have you cited all of the sources that you've drawn on in your work I mean there's no way of of tracking that in any meaningful sense that actually relies in many cases on the on the individual's integrity so what we found is there's a sort of publisher perspective <clears throat> on integrity, which is centered on the scholarly record and is centered on how do you support reproducibility of the published article. But of course, there's a whole lot of other practices which are more in the domain of you know individual researchers and by extension institutions and, and funders about ethics and, um, and those elements of integrity that go well beyond just open research practices so I'd see it as a Venn diagram there's quite a big bit that does overlap Mm. but there are also elements that are that are distinct yeah and that's probably also due to the fact that um, open science is being defined differently by different um, research communities or research stakeholder communities because um, from where I'm from like I did my PhD about a decade ago or more than that now (laughs) time is continuing to progress um and and then i i kind of sort of grew up into my professional um, research career with the advocacy for open science or almost um what is it like the yeah always like calling for revolution so the Mm -hmm. grassroots approach which is based like um fully on on ethics and values um which very much speak to integrity but but then, of course, there's a business approach to open science nowadays also with publishers having adopted not only open access and and of, um, and this is also without judgment, um, trying to find business and revenue streams um, in compliance with open science practices, um, which brought us to the situation where we currently are with high APCs or whatever high means to whoever has to pay. Um, yeah, so, um, and then also the challenges that come with that, with having to allocate research funding budgets um, more towards the publishing and taking away from other um, budget items in the research project. Um, so, okay, where we, where do we go from here? Just trying to build a um, coherent conversation to the next chapter. Um, yeah, the, the APC approach, looking into that, um, and again, like it's understandable that the publishers need to secure their businesses as in keeping operations running and flowing. Um, but what, what, what have you seen as possible for a publisher, be it for-profit, non-profit, or, and maybe also shedding some light on the differences and how they operate and establish their revenue streams or their their operations and, and paying the staff and the services, but also serving the scientific community at the same time and not harming it by overcharging, which apparently is happening in some places. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, 
the APC is is enormously valuable in the sense that it allows you to grow your revenue in line with your activity. You know, that's the that's the beauty of the APC model for for publishers. And and you know, that is one of the reasons that open access has advanced as far as it it has, because you know, we talk about incentives for researchers, but we also need to think about incentives for for publishers. You know, if you're a commercial publisher and to some degree a society publisher, if there is a revenue stream there that you can access, that incentivizes you to move in that in that direction. So we've seen that with APCs. Um, we've obviously seen that with established publishers, so the Elseviers and Springer Natures and Wiley's moving in that direction, but also new startups as they were some years ago, starting out as born open access publishers. Obviously, PLOS is one of the best examples of a not-for-profit, but there's also been many for-profit um, publishers. So I think... I think the APC has served a purpose in that it has allowed that transition to open access to happen faster than it could have done otherwise, because it kind of matches the revenues to where the publishing is, is happening. And then <clears throat> what we're seeing now is, I guess, the sort of inevitable but unintended consequence of that is that as you move to an APC based publishing world, you are erecting a barrier to those who don't have the money to to publish. Um, and in fact, there's two issues. So, so one is that researchers without the funds can't publish. The other is that you incentivize a publisher. The more you publish, the more money that you that you make, and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily a helpful incentive, particularly for for commercial publishers. And so, we are seeing some publishers that have shown very rapid growth. And coming back to our conversation about research integrity, mm. you know, Clarivate recently dis delisted a number of journals from Web of Science because they're concerned. They say content relevance, um, particularly. I think there may be some quality concerns there as well. So what we're seeing now is a lot of um a lot of debate about you know what comes beyond the APC. You know, can we reform the APC? Is one school of thought. So, what if APCs were scaled according to purchasing power? So, it might be four thousand dollars if you're in the US, but maybe it could only be a thousand dollars if you're in Indonesia. But maybe a thousand dollars is still too much. So, there's can we reform the APC but keep the basic model? Is one set of questions. The other is. We just need something completely different. This doesn't work at all. We need something more like a collective funding mechanism. Actually, maybe something more like subscriptions, where the author doesn't have to be involved. The institutions and libraries spread the cost. And there's various models looking to um, to see if that's scalable. Yeah, and also keep in mind that the APC is not the only way to um, compensate the efforts being made by a publisher mm. there's other there's subscription models with institutions um and there's also a question um of what is being charged for and what is the client like the the submitting researcher actually paying for when they pay two thousand five thousand usd for having one research article process and my assumption is that um like the big publishers, which are only a few, but with, with hundreds and thousands of journals each, well, for some of them, um, they do all kinds of work. And primarily nowadays, they've started um, also very proudly announcing that they're do, doing business with data analytics or research data analytics through mm -hmm. the data that they receive um, through the submissions. And that, of course, costs a lot of mo money to pay staff and, and the computing systems. And the question is, is the, the other submitting authors the only paying clients? And maybe they're not, but it's probably the bulk of the of the um of the revenues coming from there. And is that even a fair I mean not not even to use like is this a healthy approach to to treat your clients to let them pay mm -hmm. for for services they didn't even ask for or they're not actually asking you to do? Um, well, it, so I was I was looking recently at I mean Elsevier is the, the you know the, the prime example of, of this and it actually if you look at where Elsevier's revenues come from it's it's only about forty percent of its revenues as an organization and this is RELX this is the group which mm. effectively owns Elsevier forty percent come from academia and and science 
And actually of that 40%, oh, less than half, I think, of the revenues are from publishing now. So the rest of it is from workflow products, from data, from analytics, Scopus and SciVal. So, mm. so they do charge for that. So it's not that the APCs are subsidizing necessarily the, the data products. I, I think the bigger concern is there's a set of issues around APC, um, APCs and price of publishing, but almost the bigger issue for me is the kind of enclosure of infrastructures and, and what's effectively called platform capitalism. So you end up with big companies like Elsevier, but they're by no means the only one that own the infrastructure on which science operates. And there's a there's a risk that sometimes we spend so much time looking at the APC in the publishing world that the big problem is happening over here where so much of the infrastructure is starting to be controlled by by corporates and it's the same set of issues that once you end up with effectively a monopoly position you can almost charge what you like so you may have a monopoly on a very high impact journal that everyone wants to publish in everyone wants to subscribe to but you could also have a monopoly on you know, to some degree web of science and scopus there's almost a duopoly there you know there's two key key providers of that information which almost any institution funder researcher that tends to influence their thinking you know is this journal in web of science does it have an impact factor so you've already got commercial players controlling a lot of crucial data and crucial infrastructure mm. And there you said it, the word or the, the term that I try to avoid like the past <laughs> in my in my <laughs> approaches, the journal impact factor. Um mm. and okay, so let's dissect that for just a minute because it's it's being talked about a lot. And what pains me is that it still plays such a huge role in so many professional ex um circles like acknowledging that it is important yes everyone yet everyone knows how flawed it is and that it's not even designed to be used for what it's being used for as an indicator for a good for research integrity basically or misinterpreted as such like oh um you're publishing that journal with that imperfect so your research must be good it's not that that mm. like the word doesn't work like that so why how can we, I mean, okay, coming back to the recent article um, that you mentioned, um, how Clarivet Analytics is delisting um, uh, a range of journals. And I like another question would be, are these just scapegoats? Because I'm sure the same issues are present in, with, with any publishers and not because the publishers and editorial boards are doing a bad job. It's just because we have so many on articles to process these days like it's yeah. humanly incapable anymore um so okay the delisting and then okay so they punish these journals with um taking the impact factor away from them but like i always argue it's not the journal that's doing good research it's the researchers who publish and and describe their work in the manuscripts and the articles that that's supposed to be good research and a journal is primarily there for the curation aspect and of course like making sure that um peer review is being conducted in whichever best way possible and there we have the the issue now that too many researchers because it's a voluntary or not so, or part of the work that of already overworked researchers um just can't keep pace with with the throughput of research articles so okay um so that's the issue. And now how can we get away from the obsession with impact factors, basically the question. And again, this might take time, but I feel like this is really a topic that where I'm getting impatient because again, like there's still acknowledgement or um, it's still an incentive, but even though everybody knows it's not the measure, it cannot be the measure to, to uphold research integrity. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it is a really, thorny problem and um I, I mean i guess there's two reasons for me why it's so persistent so one is one is just the publication output is growing so rapidly that it's really hard to, to keep up so so that's one element is just the growth in publications the kind of supply is so great um and then the second is just 
if, just to give you an example, we in, in the UK, we have something called the Research Excellence Framework, which every seven years sets out to assess the quality of research within different um, research units, essentially sort of disciplinary departments and, and so mm -hmm. on. And if you ever talk to the people who sat on those panels, the volume of work they are asked to assess, it is it is physically impossible to read all of the articles or outputs that they're asked to assess. So in a sense, there has to be some kind of heuristic that they can use to make a quick a quick judgment. So so there's a lot of pressure on people to make quick judgments just because they don't have enough time. So, of course, you know, human beings, as we are anything that helps us make those judgments more quickly and maybe even outsources some of that so we haven't got to form our own judgment is incredibly appealing because there just isn't the time to to process it all um so i think i think we sort of have to recognize the reason why um almost from a reader an assessment perspective the the impact factor if the impact factor wasn't there people would have to invent some other mechanism for for those sort of quick quick judgments um then how to reform it you know there are i think quite significant moves afoot particularly in europe to reform research assessment so there are you know many hundreds of institutions and funders that have, have signed up to a, a sort of roadmap for reform of research assessment i think we are we are starting to see some of this coming through and this is partly about it's partly about not just valuing the high impact journals, but it's also about looking beyond the journal to say, well, if you produce data, if you produce code, if you maintain infrastructure, if you write software, all of all of these things are part of the the research enterprise and need to be and need to be valued. And mm. and so I think there is a there is a sort of social change that that is happening, but again, is is very slow. Um, but I don't think it's ever going to completely do away with that need for you know a quick assessment and something that helps me helps me do that. So it's it's a really thorny issue. I don't see a, a an immediate solution on the horizon. Yeah, I think that's um, like you say, it's um, for decision makers or research managers like they need a measure to make as you say a quick assessment because also overwork and and too much throughput to deal with um or <clears throat> for yeah for research quality and um we had uh karen strobans and noemi Oberbon from the quare here in the show um a couple of weeks ago and and there we also discussed yes it's really difficult to to come up with quality measures because mm -hmm. every research project is so specific in its nature and its setup and the context it's being what the research is being conducted in. But things that we can measure maybe is oh yeah it's not that I have the solution for where everybody else is just trying to find one, um, but if we if we if a researcher um also puts in their CV things like, oh, I've shared my data set on, on this and that project and that and that repository, um, again, following open science practices as in um and highlighting in the CV not the list of journals and journal names, but rather um focusing again on the topic and how the topic has been disseminated. Because I have nothing against the word impact per se, because we need impact, research impact mm. to society. This is why we do research in the first place, or, well, I do meta research nowadays, not actual applied research or basic research anymore. But um, that's the whole point in publishing to get the information out there to, to allow others to reuse it and to also um, industry um, stakeholders to to build products from, from the knowledge. And if it's being locked away through yeah, the issues that we've um, discussed, what's the whole point in doing research in the first place? So again, like maybe coming towards um, a closing of the conversation and, and this is an open topic, obviously, we're not the only mm. ones discussing this and it's, it's gonna continue until we stop doing research as as a species but um like and i feel like also research integrity and and open science are are always on the move and there will not be a 
like I don't think there's a need for hundred percent, like you you mentioned before. Um, our university was asking, um, yeah. because um, if we if we are beyond fifty percent, that's already great achievement. But to get there, to allow the research to unfold its beauty, as in to to allow the knowledge to be transferred to the other sectors of society, how can we achieve that? And what other what the means is publishing. Um, and then maybe, yeah, I, I want to give you the word, but I also want to, um, to, to throw in other publishing pathways and now also post publication peer review. Like there's a whole, maybe without going into too much detail, but, but mentioning that there's a whole new, um, ecosystem or the ecosystem is still the same, but new actors in the ecosystem, which, um, give variety to the processes which might be confusing in the beginning, but um, people like us, trainers, facilitators, um, consultants can help um, the researchers and research um, stakeholders to make sense of, to find the best fit for a current project. Yeah. Um, and then things like Diamond Open Access and um, where the publishing process is being subsidized by other means and not by APCs, which is also not... Um, clear how exactly or there's also varying models and how to uphold that and to make it sustainable is a bit of a challenge from what i've seen but yeah but back to you so i gave you a whole lot of talking points to yeah no you touched on some really interesting developments there so 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 i think there's i think there's a couple of ways to look at this so i think there's there's often the question of can something transform the system and can it replace what we currently have, which which clearly doesn't work that well? So, you know, peer review being being overstretched. Well, what if we go to post-publication peer review and we only review the things that you know seem to be attracting attention and so on? That's one idea. Or the APC doesn't work. Why don't we have diamond open access in instead? And and I so I suppose what I've often seen happen in practice is that things don't necessarily replace what's already there but they can supplement it and enhance it and one of the reasons that can happen is is research is perpetually growing there is more there are more publications each year but there are also many more research outputs being shared so if you think about the volume of data that is shared you know code and other artifacts and things we're in a sort of growing environment and so one of the questions is, what do you do with what's already there? But also, how do you deal with the growth and the proliferation, mm -hmm. which is putting the system under, under strain? So um, if you take something like Diamond Open Access, I've been looking at this for quite a few years. And, and one of the things we often just look at is, is where is content being being published and who is publishing it and there's all sorts of challenges about what database do you use and how comprehensive is it and so on it tends to be biased towards the west biased towards the english language but but even so diamond open access has been pretty small for quite a long time and it, it's not the growth coming back to my point about apcs the growth has tended to be in commercial open access but that doesn't necessarily mean it isn't a way forward because what's going to happen is there will be certain disciplines where the APC works okay or APC with waivers and so on. It can work okay in some contexts, but there was a, a blog from the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association that came out a few weeks ago. They've been running some workshops on equity and they mm -hmm. suggest the idea of rainbow open access. So the idea that, you know, there isn't just one flavor of open access actually we're going to need a rainbow of different solutions and i think diamond open access is absolutely going to be one of those and there are you know, there's quite exciting developments i think being led by the european commission and national funders in europe to support something called open research europe which already exists it's currently outsourced to f1000 which is a subsidiary of taylor and francis one of the big commercial publishers but the intention is to transition that to an open source platform that is you know run by a not for a not-for-profit entity so is is both diamond in terms of no author fees um and no charges to read but is also completely not-for-profit without a large commercial sort of controlling the infrastructure so that's a really quite ambitious activity do i think that's going to put taylor and francis and elsevier and wiley out of business 
no, I don't. I don't think that's realistically going to happen. But could that become a really important re uh, venue for some researchers who might struggle to get into those journals or don't have the funds? I think it could. And so I think it is about seeing we need a diversity of solutions. I really liked that term, <clears throat> rainbow open access, um, recognizing it's not necessarily going to replace, but there are things that can usefully supplement the existing system. Preprints being another one, you know, we've seen rapid growth in, in preprints. When you post a preprint, does it mean you don't also submit it to a journal? Sometimes it might, but in most cases, the incentives and so on are there that, you know, yeah. authors still want to get it published in a journal, but um, but the preprint is additive, you know, and it adds value, it gets it out there sooner. Yeah. And also, like, I, I as a biologist, I feel um, like everything is an ecosystem, like every industry sector and also academia mm. has an ecosystem. And an ecosystem, if you look at the African savanna, has all kinds of actors in it, from flies to mosquitoes to maybe not rabbits, naturally, but <laughs> all of the indigenous species there. But And then you have elephants, hyenas, lionesses, and um, all kinds of, of critter. And everybody has a role to play. So how about we um, look again at the publishing ecosystem, where I think there has been a lot of focus on the, you can call them hyenas or elephants, like the big elephants in the room. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, or maybe unintentionally ha um, having developed into something that's um, exploiting as a harsh word, but has harmed the system like painfully, as in extracting too much money into mm -hmm. just one direction. Um, and now, yeah, as evolution goes, now we shift it back to to a better, like to rebalance towards other mm -hmm. actors, also for the publishing services. And I agree. Like some some of my colleagues want to see the big publishers collapse, and I think where there's a time for every empire until it collapses. But I I believe there is room for everyone in it, and and I feel that the big publishers also provide a lot of um. Uh, value as in you know, product developments, um, services, workflows, um, automations to for us as a community, as a scholarly community to be able to to get on top of the wave of the of the high output that research produces. Mm -hmm. so, um, and everybody can learn from that. Like we can all learn from each other and build an ecosystem that's yeah, more balanced and fair and globally inclusive. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth them, you know, for all their flaws, the the publishers are very international, you know, in a way that many of the other actors in, in science aren't, you know, institutions are, are rooted in a particular national context. Virtually all funders are rooted in a national or, or regional context. So, Publishers do actually have a, an ability to move research around the world in a way that is perhaps more di more difficult. And that's not it's not as simple as just putting it on the web. You know, it is obviously it's about the discoverability and so on, but it is also about marketing and communication in those in those different markets. So I think it's you know, they are very flawed. The profit margins are ridiculously high and there's reasons for that. But um and that's about the dysfunction of the of the system, the sort of monopoly that you can have on on journals. But I think we also need to recognise there is some value that having those those global corporations involved can bring, and and just the scale of what they're doing. You know, say Elsevier disappears and the system has to pick up an extra million articles a, a year or whatever. You know, they are they are operating at a phenomenal a phenomenal scale that is very difficult to replicate from a sort of diamond open access model. So I think we have to keep recognizing the flaws and the limitations. And, and there's a really important place for, I think, for sort of regulation and some forms of regulation there to avoid the, the sort of private actors extracting too much money from the system. And there's a set of challenges there. But I think we also have to not throw out the baby with the bathwater and say that, you know, commercial actors, big publishers have nothing to to yeah. offer. You know, it's a mix of good and bad, as most things are. Sure. Yeah, and it's also important to 
to remember, I think like the power that the customer, the client has as in the research institution and the researcher of mm. like there's always options and there's always um a negotiation um power that can be um put forth. So and this has has been happened in the past and will continue to happen. So if and then there's also examples of um, research institutions coming together in coalitions to to strengthen their negotiation power. Um, so so there's always that. And yeah, I think we're, we're we live in interesting times. <laughs> there is a lot of work to do for all of us. And um, yeah, it's it's yeah um, basically how. Like it's it's gonna be interesting to to see the the future developments near and far. It's been a great pleasure talking to you, and um yeah, what's what's next on your agenda? Where or what is maybe your what what's your best case scenario on how the next three to five years will unfold and and what direction do you think publishing will take? I think the best case scenario. I think on to, in terms of integrity, I think actually seeing a seeing a reassertion of the importance of integrity and and quality. I think so. I think in some respects we've gone too far in terms of the the growth, and I think integrity has been compromised. So I think a reassertion of the value of peer review, the importance of reproducibility, and I think we're just starting to see some signs of that coming. So I hope that will that will gather momentum and actually that in itself could then drive people back to some of the more trusted established established names particularly societies so i think a reassertion of integrity is one thing that i'd i'd hope to see i do really hope that some of the diamond open access initiatives will gain support um, and that support both from funders and institutions but also crucially from the researcher community so i think you know researchers being willing to to publish in, in places that don't have an impact factor. So Open Research Europe has stated it is not seeking an impact factor. That's not what it's about. And of course, that is a risk, you know, because researchers are incentivized to publish in places with, with impact factors. So it does rely on the research community, not necessarily with every paper, but with some of their papers being willing to say, I choose to support this kind of initiative. I choose to support something that's not for profit, that's that's reproducible, that's being run on behalf of the community, rather than channeling all my papers to the to the commercial publishers. So I think that, yeah, reassertion of integrity and then, you know, back to that diversity and not seeing the big publishers squeeze out everyone else to the detriment of the, the system as a whole. Mm. Thank you so much, Rob. So all the best for for yeah for the next um project and um, hopefully speak to you soon um here or elsewhere at a conference and um yeah see you soon thanks very much